Hello, everyone, and welcome again to another Simply M Spotlight Moment. Thank you for being here today. I am so enthusiastic to share my guest with all of you. As you all know, Simply M, the movement is a dance community, but also I've created it as a platform to share about all the amazing people that I meet along the way on this journey we call life. So music is something that is so important to me in my daily life. And I know that I share that with many of you. Music is the language of the heart and of the soul. And today's guest has been blessed with such a beautiful voice and a beautiful story that there was no way that I can keep her all to myself. So today we have this lovely young woman, Elizabeth Sanchez, who I had the opportunity to meet through a mutual friend. And I was just blown away with her story, with her personality, with her energy, with her faith in God, with her perseverance. So I don't even want to speak for her. That's more than enough time for me to say it. I just want to say thank you, Elizabeth, again, for being here today with me. Thank you for being a part of this interview today. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. Right now, I'm so speechless for that beautiful entrance that you give to me. Um, I'm glad that sometimes God brings you people and you don't, sometimes you don't know that those people can help you to meet more people awesome like you. So for me, it was such an, a big experience that we could meet through that mutual friend. And now we are together um, talking about a real life because my life is real. Yes. And I say that my life is hard, sad, but with happy ending, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I'm glad that the happy ending is the one that I was focused to give. So. Thank you again for inviting me to this beautiful space. You're welcome. You're welcome. And you're, and it's so true what you're saying, the way that God just puts everything in the perfect order, we, even when we don't think that it is, because how interesting it is to know that both you and I were born in the same country. We were both born in Cuba in different decades, right? Both <laughs> of, yeah. Both of us <laughs> were, then went to another country. Because my family, just like yours, you know, the United States wasn't the, the next stop after Cuba. We went to another country. And here we both ended up in the same country, right? Um, and meeting so unexpectedly. So so life and just God orders the steps. He knows exactly um, what the plan is, even when we have moments that we doubt or we don't understand. So you were born in Placetas, right? Mm -hmm. So for those that, for those folks that don't know, and I'm going to tell you a little secret, which is very funny. Um, my family is from La Habana and my dad is actually from Caribarien. My boyfriend and his family is from Placetas. Oh, look. <laughs> <laughs> well, think of me every time. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so, um, so you were born in Cuba in 1993. Mm -hmm. Funny enough too, we're both little fishies we're both Pisces so <laughs> I'm, I was oh, born really March. yeah I'm a Pisces as well yes oh March 1 March 6 so we're just oh, five look. days apart and me March 11 yeah oh, look at that it it's does. like we're connected absolutely absolutely but now when you were born there was um share with share with the viewers um the situation what happened with your health as soon as you were born and how that all transpired yeah, first I'm going to share how God guide my parents in his like in his path, right? Um, my parents were two young people that they think that life it, it was like walking in life and, and nothing will happen. And the good things, um, you you get the good things because you did good stuff. And the bad thing is it was because you did something bad and then the 
the life that you were living was pushing you and telling you, oh, you're doing bad. Okay. Like first parents, they were so happy that they were going to have their, their first child. And they were even happier because it was going to be a girl. And they were so excited. And, and, and I was this type of girl, even after I was born, that I have everything. I have a lot of clothes. I have my little um, thing to sleep, my little bed to sleep. Well, and, and a lot of toys. Well, I was very blessed. Even in 93, that was such a hard year. I was really blessed. Okay, they were running through the hospital because my mom begins to get a lot of contractions. And the ambulance was pretty hard to get. So one aunt of mine tell my dad, is his sister, and they tell him, no, Ricardo, don't worry. I'm going to find you the ambulance and everything was going to be okay. Okay, now is the worst part. When my mom was getting me burned, you know, like, like the mom, they both pushing and I'm so happy that their first child, poof, the lights were off. Like the lights didn't respond. I, I said that I, that I left with the lights, you know, that my body left with the, with the lights, like I, I just died. Then the lights like begin to recover again. And I said that I recover with the lights. The doctors um, take me out from my mom in his belly, but I was dead, like totally dead. Um, they put me, I have to go to Placeta <laughs> oh, a long way. And my mom didn't see me when I was born. Um, they put me there in a incubator for 28 days. Um, and it was like the doctors, anything that the doctors were saying was like, um she's going to die and don't worry and you're not going to have your child because she's going to die in instantly like you have a, a lot of couple of hours because she's dying like goodbye to her a pastor came and they tell to my mom take um um something in the bible and, and my mom said, okay, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to read the Bible and let me see what I'm going to take, right? And it says, I cannot say in English, so I'm going to say in Spanish. Sure, go it ahead. It says, el cautivo será rescatado del valiente y tu pleito yo lo defenderé y yo salvaré a tus hijos. Mm. And it was in plural. You know, both. And my mom was like, I cannot believe it. I'm waiting for only one. And it, it was like God was always talking to them from people, from, from the Bible. And they were like, I don't believe this. Okay. Um, I get out of the hospital pretty bad. The 11th of April. It was an Easter Sunday. Wow. Um, my parents were like so happy, even though I was dead. They were so happy because they said, okay, she is not dead. Because I believe that God gives me that promise and she's going to recover. Always my parents were saying that stuff. The doctors tell them we did the 10%, the 10%. And you guys try to do the rest because your daughter is a vegetable and she's going to die. And if she leaves, she's going to be a pain for you. And my parents say, thank you so much. <laughs> We're going home. Yeah. When I went home, I was living with my grandma from the part of my mom, the mom of my mom. I was living with all of my aunts and my two parents and a cousin that he's one year older than me. Um, my aunt and my grandma were so happy because I was the first girl from both families. And they were like, oh yeah, finally a girl because the rest it was boys, 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 boys. <laughs> and they finally see a girl, you know, like we don't care if she's 
if she is like this, so sick, we are happy. It's a girl, finally. So, um, my grandma, the mom of my mom, uh, my mom was telling me that she always passed because we have a really big hallway. And in that big hallway, we have room next to it. And my grandma always passed and look through, through the door. And she was always telling my mom, don't worry, she's going to be okay. But I feel so sad seeing you sad. You know, like a mother was feeling sad for her daughter. Sure. Okay. Time passed. My parents begin to give me a lot of exercise. I listen to um, opera music. Um, Dad called me my, when I was like this, like really tense. Um, they were passing me a lot of the stuff to my nose because I have my nose really um, bad. My eyes, it was rolling. Like when, when some people see me, they see only the, the white thing. Like I was mm -hmm. deaf. Um, when my mom see me for the first time, the only thing that she said to my dad was, oh, I'm so happy that she has blue eyes <laughs> because God granted me the, my first child the way that I wanted, mm -hmm. even though she's dying. Yeah. When I was one year old, um, I began to get better and better and better. And when I was one year old, I, I looked like a baby that I didn't have anything. Like it didn't pass me anything. Like I was, I, I was very, I talked to everybody. I was really happy. The walking, yeah, a little bit. It was a, it was a little hard for me, the walk. But the talk, I was really talk to me, to everybody. Um, and, and I was pretty happy. Um, I have to leave. Cuba and moved to Dominican Republic when I was three. I didn't do the school in Cuba because at the same time that I was going to begin the school in Cuba, I, I flew to Dominican Republic. Uh, we were so happy, but I only left with mom and dad. The rest of my family stay in Cuba. We were, and my mom was pregnant <laughs> with my brother. And we were so happy because we get out as missionary. Um, and my dad and my dad said, oh, I'm so happy because we're going to talk about God and we're going to be, we're going to have such a great time. And he was happy because I, and, and he was telling to me, you're going to be in a really good school and they're going to give you a lot of love. And I was like, yay, daddy, I'm so glad that you're telling me that. Um, I, the first city that I went was La Vega. That was the city that my brother um, born. It's a little city, like really calm, really like, it, it looks like you are like in, not in the, it was not like such a city city. It was like city, like in different city. Like it was city for people that doesn't have a lot of money, right. you know? Um, I was living in a house that the pastor gave it to us and, and, you, and I was happy. My brother got born. Um, my parents were so happy that they see a normal baby born and right. I was happy to, to have my brother and everything. Now it's the time to look for my school because I was going to begin kinder. <laughs> Right, and that's an exciting and time. That's an exciting time. I was Usually. so happy. Yeah, I'm sure. I I was so happy. And they tell the people around there, they tell them, and hey, Carolita, you have to go to this school. I'm not going to tell the name because I don't want to. You have to go to this school because it's a pretty good school and it's Christian and your daughter will love it. And I was so excited. And I said to my parents, oh, yay, I'm going to be in the school. I'm going to have a lot of friends and I'm going to see different people. And I'm, and I'm not going to be around my, my mom and my dad all the time. So I thought that for me, it was going to be like a bird flying and really happy. And it was all the opposite. Um, my parents left me in kinder and... I remember that when my parents left me, the teacher began to change her face. 
like she, like with a face like it was like Elisa the journal welcome here now um, let me ask let me ask you was it kind of like a boarding school type of situation where you had to be there um several days in a row or would you go to school during the day and then come back home or was no, it, it was a boarding it was all day all day I see okay so they, they so that's why you said they left you there because you would you were you were essentially almost living there which mm -hmm. is right no I was not leaving the school I have to be all day like from 7 a.m to okay. 1 p.m oh, okay so you would go home every day okay Just yeah wanted to be clear on that okay yeah but, but um, once they but once they dropped you off you noticed a shift in her attitude towards you mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I see. um I remember um, now, I, you know, that now I'm 30, but sometimes this part get a love to me in my heart because now I see it with other kids and it gets me even worse. I remember that she was calling every child from names, through names, and, and they tell her, okay, we're going now to do the multiplication table. And I see that everyone, all boys and all girls were doing it like, like so fast. And when it was my turn, she told me, Elizabeth, how is six times three? And I was like, no, I, I don't know. Because I felt that I have something wrong. Like, like I felt it, you know? Like I felt that, I felt like all the kids were like one step ahead of me and I was still behind. And that type of thing put me really like, really sad. Yeah. And well, I, and she told me, okay, sit down. Okay, sit down. And then it, it was time to go to lunch. And she didn't let me go to lunch. She put me a chair looking at the wall. And she told me, uh, you did really bad today, Elizabeth. A, you 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 are such a bad student, and I was mm -hmm. like, I'm such a bad student because I don't know my multiplication table. No, right. I it's because since I was a little girl, I respond like that because my parents teach me that way, you know. And I said to her, "That's why you put me here because I didn't know my <laughs> my multiplication table." I see it like so insane. Like for me, it's not something normal. So I think the one that you have a problem is you, not me sure and she and she was like no you did really bad so now you're going to see the wall for the whole entire time that you're here until we leave to go to home to go home and i was like okay i remember that i put my head on the table and i was crying 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 like crying like hard and when I stopped crying, I have a really beautiful um, window next to me. And I said to God, God, why you are trying to put me in this spot? If the only thing that I do is give love to other people. And the people that I think that I give love, they're telling me I'm not good at it. But I didn't say it in this way. I say it like in a really, I was really mad. Right. to God you yeah. know then the girl because I have um my bullying was from girls not from boys the boys love me the girls hate me then the girls was telling me oh Elisa you know you're ugly um we hate you because we hate um your type of hair we hate your type of eyes the color of your eyes we hate you everything. And I have to use uh, uh, shoes that were for people that does, cannot walk properly. Right. And like, those shoes like, were helping me. Right. Like orthopedic shoes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Orthopedic and shoes. And those shoes were helping me. And they laugh even because of that. The girls, of course. And, and, I, and one time I tell to the first girl, that was the one who began the bullying. And I tell her, why do you hate me so much? I didn't do anything to you. And the only people that I have here in this country is my parents. 
and you have your parents, your grandmother, your grandfather. I even the only people I have here is my parents and my brother, and that's it. And I don't know why you hate me. And she tell me, no, I hate you it's because I cannot even see you because I hate like your face. It's your face, the only thing that bothers me. And I'm like, I cannot change my face because it's the face that God gave me. And every and that's why she was, that was the reason that she locked me in the bathroom, you know, because she doesn't want to see my face. She didn't want to see your face. Um, when we get out, uh, when we have to do the line to go again through to see the teacher, she uh, was um, pulling my hair also in the line like this and I was like oh it hurts and I was crying and everything okay time passed and I passed through first grade finally I have a good teacher but I begin to be a rough person everything bothers me if the people was telling me oh the blue sky I tell her don't bother me I I don't like the blue sky so leave me alone I respond that way in first grade. So you have to be like, I have to mature pretty fast. But I respond in that way pretty like offensive, you know, like I was always offensive. And, and then when I went home, it was my escape to cry. But I cried in my room alone. My parents doesn't see me, not even my brother. I was crying alone. And when I cry, I do this. And then I, I said, oh, I'm happy now. Like, I don't know. I, I, forgot, I forget the problem like this. Okay, time passed. I did in that school from kinder through fourth grade. And then I went to fifth grade to another school and then to another school. I came to this country because my parents want to find a, a better time for me and a better way of learning. And they saw that here in the United States, they have programs for people that have learning disabilities. And, and, the, and the president helped you though here. And my parents said, oh, don't worry, let's see how it goes. Okay. I did here elementary, in this country I did elementary through university. And from elementary through high school, I was pretty happy because I see that everyone loves me, that everyone accepts me. And I was like, oh, I'm so happy. Finally, I'm in a school that everyone loves me. Okay. Time passed, passed and passed. And I was in my last year of university. I graduated from the university in 2016. I graduated from Barry University in Miami Shores. And I had to take my last class. It was American government. And, I was, and the teacher said to the class, please, you have to do a paper talking about what you learned in my class and what things that I teach you, you can put it in action in your life. And I was like, oh, this is a pretty comfortable job for me. Like, I'm happy. I can do it, you know? Like, I was happy. I did my paper, my dad jacket. Um, the guy that you just see next to me was my dad. Yeah. <laughs> um, my dad jacket. I went to the writing center and they checked and they said, Elizabeth, I'm so proud of you. Even my English teacher was there. He told me, I'm so happy for you that you're in your last year and you did this. I'm so happy. Um, and it came the day that everyone has to give the final paper. And I was so happy with my paper. And when it was my turn, I give it in a folder because I'm like that. I give it to the teacher in a folder and everything. And I said, oh, look, teacher, um, this is, this is my, my work. And, I, and she was like, oh, thank you, Elisa. But with an attitude, you know, like she didn't like me. <laughs> That's the reason. She hated me, like hated me. Since the first time I put my feet in her class, that lady hated me, you know? <laughs> and I was like, oh, look, it's, I finally did my job. But, you know, I, I forgot my work. But, you know, I forgot it that she put me that bad face and everything. Okay. The next day, she passed the works to everybody. And she was so happy with everybody. 
and she tell me, Elizabeth, you did plagiarism. And I was like, I cannot believe it. But I was not with this face. I was with a face like I want to cry, you know? Right. And, and I was, and I, and, and I tell her, I cannot believe it. I went to the writing center. The people in the call program helped me. Call program is the program that I was for a student with learning disabilities. And even my dad checked it. And he told me that I was doing it right and everything. And she was like, no, you did plagiarism because your intelligence doesn't give you the time to do a work like this. Oh, I see. And I was like, what are you telling me? Like, uh, like in, when she told me that, I explode, you know? And I, was, and I tell her, no, don't worry. Thank you so much. And I left. But, not, but I didn't explode in, in tears in front of her. I explode in tears outside. Yeah. I call my dad and I tell her, dad, dad, it passed me this, 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 and this. And I think she hates me. And she told me that I have to be in her office because she wants to talk to me. But I don't want to be alone because I saw her that she was in, in a defensive way. So can you go with me? And my dad tell, him, tell me, yes, I will go with you. And everything is going to be all right. Every time I have my problem, my dad always tell me that. Everything, Mimi, everything is going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. And I was like, okay, everything is going to be all right, but with not her, you know? Yeah. Inside of me. We went upstairs and I was shaking, like shaking. Even though I have my dad next to me, I was still shaking. I entered in the office. And she said, oh, look at that. She came with her dad. Like she thought that I, that I bring my dad to be, like my dad will be like my, my protector. Yeah, yeah. Like your bodyguard, yeah. And I'm like, no, it's not what you think. <laughs> I bring him because he's going to tell you the same thing that I tell you in class this morning to see if you understand. If not, we don't know what we're going to do. Okay, she tell me, get out of my office. I don't want to see your face. And I'm like, okay, I'm leaving. And leave me with your dog talking. And I heard everything from outside. And my dad was explaining her like really nice. Everything, like my, dis my disability and everything. And she was like, like, you, you know some people here. like when you talk and the words came from here and then outside here yeah like no and my dad said oh no now I know who has the problem <laughs> is right. you my lady it's not yeah. my my daughter okay so I have to take my dad said no don't worry she's going to drop your class and she's going to take it again and I remember when I was <clears throat> and everything in English like I was talking to her like like I'm talking to you now and she gave me the paper that I have to sign and I remember that when I was signing, she was with such a big happy face. Like she was like this, even in the time that I was signing. And, and when I saw her, I was like, I cannot believe that you're doing this in my face. No, I right. tell her that. I tell her that in that way because I cannot overwhelm anything more, you know? And she was like, well, but I'm happy. Finally, you're leaving. And I'm like, no, the one that is happy is me because the one that who has the problem is you. I don't want that some other people that came here and doesn't have the, the authority that I have in myself. You can do the same thing to them. And those poor people will not even talk because they, they don't still have their authority in themselves. That's yeah. for the people that... that that I'm scared of because you're a witch. Right. <laughs> yeah, she was the witch of Snow White. <laughs> and, and, and she told me, okay, now I'm leave. And I was like, and I'm saying, yeah, I'm leaving. Thank God I'm not going to see your face again. And, but I was really mad. And then I left. And then I said to my dad, dad, I'm not going to graduate in my <laughs> Because it was that class and another one. It was only two classes left that I have to graduate. 
Right. And now I'm like, Dad, I'm not going to graduate in 2016. And my best friend is waiting for me because we're going to graduate together. And I need to graduate with my best friend. You know, like you want one thing, but then the devil is telling you another thing. Like I wasn't sure. that way. Yeah. And my dad said, no, don't worry. You're going to take the class in January and you're going to graduate with your best friend in May. So don't worry. I went again to my counselor in the call program and I said, Maddie, I'm here again. And she's telling me again, Elisa, we need to find what teacher I can put you for American government. And I'm like, yes, we are again in the same thing. And she said to me, I'm not going to put you again with a woman because I don't want another problem. And I'm like, please, no, find me a teacher that is a man, please. And she said, I mean, no, don't worry, I'm going to find a teacher that is a man. Okay. The teacher, it was Mr. Foreman, a uh, really good man. I did his class in January, in the spring. I was so happy. He understand me. He guide me. He told me the value that I have as a student. And then the same exam came because he did the class um, the same as her, but a little bit more easy. He didn't put a lot of stuff. But the exam, they have to give it the same way every teacher in that class because it was the, the lemma of, of that department. And when I did my exam, again, I got an F. And he told me, Elizabeth, I don't want you to see you cry again for this. Because I know that you cry about this exam with the other teacher. Because he also called me again in his office, but in a different way, you know, different environment. Sure. And he told me, the only thing that I'm going to tell you is that you have to do a paper explaining how you felt in my class and what you got from my class as a human being. Mm. And I said, oh, thank you so much. So I give him that paper and thanks to that, I could graduate. The day of my graduation, it was a day that I never going to forget. When the people call my name, and they tell me Elisa Sanchez, and you know that they have to give you the paper, but it's not your, your, your real diploma, it's just the paper, but I was even happier about that. And my best friend was sitting behind me three rows again, three, three rows behind me. And I tell her, Jean, I did it. And he was like, I knew that you will did it, you know? Like my best friend was so happy. But when I was going down to the stairs, my teacher, Mr. Foreman, was inside uh, of, you know, all of that black things that they put in the, in the graduation stuff and everything. And I saw someone do, do me this, Elizabeth, uh -huh. Elizabeth. And I was like, who's calling me? Like, and, and he said, Elizabeth, this is me, Mr. Foreman. I have to give you a hug. And I'm like, oh, Mr. Foreman. So, you know, we hugged and he told me, I know that you will say it because I knew that everything that you do, you do it with passion. And I tell him, for me, the passion you give it again to me, like that guy give the passion again to me to study again, like to love that, to love American government again, you know, and well, uh, when I graduate, I have to go, go back to do my last class um, in the summer. And he was doing the same class, Mr. Foreman, in the summer. And one time I was in the call program doing my, my, my work and he appeared with his little son. And again, Elisa, mm -hmm. Elisa. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, Mr. Foreman, hi, I'm up. I just, uh, this is my last class and I'm leaving. And he's telling me, yeah, I'm really proud of you, but I don't came here to talk about this. I just came here because I want that you meet my little uh, boy oh. because I talk too much about you to my family. 
And I was like, oh, hi. And then I remember that he said to his son, son, this is one of the best students that I have. Not even though she has a learning disability, it, she knew how to take that learning disability as a gift to the humanity. And when I heard that, I felt so happy. Okay, when I finished all that class, I left directly to the Opera of Miami to work in Carmen. Um, I was one of the cigarettes girls. Um, and I was so happy that, that I was my first time in a stage and I didn't have any more stage fright because when I was younger in the churches, they invite me to sing, but I have a stage fright. I even jump from the stage and, and it was pretty hard. And the Opera of Miami helped me of not doing that anymore. So I worked that year with them. And then it was my time to looking for a producer. And, uh, and none of the producers that I got, I, I like. And the first city I worked with Moisés Carrasana. He is one of the singers of Bless. Bless is a, a Christian band. And he was my first producer. And we did Hope is Born is the name of my city in English. In Spanish is Nace Una Esperanza. Yeah. And the first song of my city, it called Love No Matter What. I did it in three languages. I did it in Spanish, in English, and in Portuguese. Um, and I have like to, to recover again my identity. So when I wrote that song, I feel like I was even happier because I said, oh, I'm, I'm leaving behind that I didn't know how to um, um, be in a bike. Um, I, because I, I was telling like my, my feelings, the real me in that song, that of right. course the people can hear it in Spotify. They pulled off no matter what, Elizabeth Sanchez and they could hear it. Okay, so my city finish, it talks about love, peace, faith, and hope is the main combination of the first city. And then I won best album of the year in Premios Redención. Premios Redención is, is like you winning an Oscar in, in Hollywood, for example, but in the Christian part, you know? So I was really happy that my that I won that 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 thing for my city. Okay, so I finished that, and now I'm working with a new producer because my first producer is really um, busy in his church and everything. And now I'm working with a new producer, and this new producer take me now as Elizabeth more mature, and Moisés Moisés took me as Elizabeth baby. Like he has to teach me how to be the singer that I am now, the songwriter that I am now, you know? And this um, producer just took me like, right now, Melissa Sanchez songwriter, thanks to Moises Carrasana. And um, so he was teaching me that. And, and then he told me, now we have to work in our first, um son me and you and I was like okay let's do it mm -hmm. and I did Soy Amada Soy Amada is from Psalms 23 it talks about how God loved you but I also referred that song through the life of Esther because I felt that my life is the same as the Queen Esther um, she was a woman that God drowned her with beauty, drowned her with intelligence, but she also got bullies around her that doesn't believe in her. And God has to give her the space and tell her, you can't do it because I grant you with all of this. So I felt that my life was like her because she was the type of woman that always go to the world and talk to the people and tell the people how they felt, even though she was feeling sad, but she didn't tell her feelings, even though she's near influence of other people. And I'm like that. Um, 
my life when then I in high school I also went to Joe DiMaggio Hospital to see the kids of cancer with my math teacher and it was one of the best experiences that I have because I felt the sadness of those parents and I reflect my parents with those parents. Time passed and my life career now in music began to get overflowed, but overflowed like in a really good way. Um, the first um, country that invited me was Dominican Republic. That's ironic. Uh-huh. I was <laughs> like, I cannot believe this. But then I felt that God wanted me to do this so I can be more relief even more, you know. Uh, I did. I was so happy uh, doing that and being again with my people because I felt that they are my people. Even though they hate me, they are my people, you know, because I grow with them. I grow with that, eating their food. I grow with being, doing what they do. So for me, they're my people, you know, and my brother is Dominican. So it, it's something that even though sometimes I want to forget, I still have it here in my home because my brother is from, from there. And I was happy to go again because I felt like a relief. And I remember one, one, one person, they tell me, Lisa, you have to go to this program because it's one of the most popular programs is Esta Noche with Raul Grisanti. And he is one of the best uh, speakers in the Dominican Republic and he wants to meet you. And I was like, how I'm going to tell this guy that I, that I suffer bullying in this country looking me around too much people from Dominican Republic and around the world. So God grant me peace because I, I don't know how that guy will be, you know. So when I entered the program, it was the first program that I have to be. I saw everyone like so chill, like, oh, welcome. You're so welcome here. You're the singer. And I'm like, yeah, nice to meet you because I felt like we are, you know. And then he said, he's waiting for you. And he's so happy to meet you, like Raul. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm like, oh, yay. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> the most important people in, in this channel. He's happy to see me, yay. Because I thought that he was going to be like, you know, this guy, like walk like this. And he was all the opposite. And when I enter, uh, I begin to talk about um, my life, everything I talk right now. And when I enter, that I tell him that I suffer bullying in his country, like he looked at me like crying. And I was like, what happened here? He's crying because he's sad. He's crying because he's mad. Or he's crying because he wants more people to look at his channel. You know, like you begin to talk like that. But no, he's a type of man that believes in God. Um, loves all the people that come here. And my story touched his heart a lot. That he told me that, that I look like one of his grandchild. Like he seemed like one of his grandchild. Like, like he loves me now as a family. And he told me, now with all these people watching, I need to tell that me as a Dominican, I want to give you sorry for the way that we treat you in this country. It was not good that you were treated that way but the best part is now is that now I'm happy because you see because all of that problem that you want the music in your life. Mm -hmm. And I felt like this and, I, and you know, I felt that God like take me out a really big bag of rocks that I still have it on my back. Right, exactly. And God get get those like God tell me, Elisa, it's done. 
but I have to take those bags off last year, February of last year. That was my trip to Dominican Republic. But imagine it had to pass all of that time so I could be like more free, but God wanted me to be that free in that program. I mean, that instant and with that person, you know? Right, right. So I was happy and then I seen and, and now I'm happy, I'm blessed. And then I did my, and then I went to Colombia and I went three times to Mexico. And now I'm finishing my new book um, that is my life story in a, yeah, from Pan House, my editorial. And I'm, I'm finishing now my new single. It's an opera rock. So yeah, I'm happy. <laughs> so that's a little bit of my life. Well, that was your entire life up until this moment. And, mm -hmm. and there's so much, um, you know, that, that stood out for me. Um, thank you for being so open and so honest. And it's incredible that you have such a vivid recollection, right, of all the pivotal moments, because I kind of feel as you were sharing all of that with me and with all the viewers, it was like you had these key pivotal moments that really stood out for you um, from the moment that you were like three years old and, and up until you were a young adult at, you know, in college at, at the university. Um, I just kind of want to take it back just briefly. So when, and I just went through this with my sister just like three years ago when my niece was born. I don't have any children myself, but my sister, thank God, had the first grandchild for my parents. Um, so I'm an aunt. And I lived firsthand vicariously through her, seeing how much, and she, and my, my niece, let me say, was born during the pandemic. And it was like right near the beginning of it. So there was wow. a lot of panic around we couldn't be there at the hospital we couldn't go to the hospital they had to be by themselves so both her and my brother-in-law were being parents for the very first time and that's here in the United States for those um folks that have never been to a country like Cuba and similar countries that um have the type of conditions that are very poor in every sense of the word um now you're multiplying the fear of new parents the apprehension with all these other things like the electricity going out in the hospital in that moment where you were being born, right? So how scary for your parents to be facing all of that with limited resources. Um, and the only main resource they had from what you shared was their faith, right? And their family who was like your grandmother who was supporting them and praying with them and believing with them. Um, I hear so many stories about people that have a tragic situation happen to a loved one that ends up in a hospital where they're literally on the brink of life or death. And sometimes family members will make a decision to not allow certain people in the room of their loved one because they don't want any negativity at all whatsoever to, to be anywhere around the person that that they're that they want that they believe will be saved right um and so when the doctors just said to your parents listen game over just take her home and you know let it be what it's going to be um that's huge and even though you were a, a small child you know that's the reason i brought up the whole thing about the energy in the rooms is that is that we all absorb that energy and that memory is in your cells. I'm sure you're obviously your parents have told you the way that my parents have told me stories when I was one and when we left Cuba, but it's really in your cells because your spirit was there. You know, children here, no matter what condition the child is in. And, and then to face disappointment yet again at still a, an impressionable age like three, four, five, six, seven years old, and to feel less than, to be made, you know, to feel less than, to be felt like othered, um, that's not easy at all. When you had already overcome all these 
challenges and we're still overcoming some of them. I mean, I wore also orthopedic shoes for a while when I was a little girl and this was back in the eighties and they were ugly. What well, they consider, you know, they were clunky. <laughs> they were not cute shoes. Mm-hmm. Right. And I wear it on the 90s, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, even less so, exactly. Even less so because, exactly, as, as the decades go by, the kids look better than the adults now. Like, like when I was a kid, the clothes was all pretty ugly. You look like a kid. Now the little kids can look like little mini adults. You're right about that. But mm-hmm. still, the orthopedic shoes were definitely not fun to wear and to go to school with, right? So my question to you is, um, and in that impressionable age, you know, let's say between the ages of three and 10, were you already feeling that inner stirring of music being a lifeline for you, of being an escape? Mm-hmm. Since I was three. It's because I sing since I was three. So you were singing since you were three years old. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. And, and was it something that you did? um privately or you only privately it, so you didn't even share it with your parents that much sometimes, sometimes when I feel like it because when I was five entering to six I began to my parents said share with us um your singing and I answer when I feel like it like in this way and everything because I, I was still feeling pretty bad you know yeah and I begin to think that everything good that I did, I, o- I only want to share for me. Of course, because you were, I'm and, sure you were afraid of criticism or afraid mm-hmm. of being rejected because that was already something you were carrying inside of you from your interactions with the teachers um, at the school in elementary school and the other and the other children. And that's what happens, right? To people that have been bullied or mistreated is that you, number one, become very defensive. And Mm -hmm. number two, you're not going to share anything at all because that's you putting yourself at risk of being attacked or put down. Mm -hmm. So you are hiding your your gift of, of, of your voice, of your love for music because of all these different experiences you were having as a, as a young child at, in school when you should feel safe in school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really hard. And what was it like for you? Um, because again, some a lot of people can relate to this and some people can't as much. Like for example, and so I, I'll put this into words. Um, some people say, oh, I mo- we moved around most of my life. You know, we we moved from California to wherever or even within their same state but there's something and that's still impressionable for young children but even more so when you're literally going from one country to another you're going to a totally different culture right and then you do it yet again for a second time um what what do you think helped you to open yourself up again once you came to the United States to the possibility of having a better experience? What do you think allowed you to open up a little more? Um, It was first the help of God and and then the help of my parents. They told me, Elisa, we have to leave Dominican Republic. Not only because they do, you, you were so sad because from all of the things at school, but we also need to find you a good way of learning. And in that country, they have programs for students with the disabilities that maybe you have. And when they told me that, I was like, okay, I'm happy. We're leaving. Uh, Since I was a little girl, I always was a really, um, I heard a lot what my parents told me because I knew that everything that they would tell me, it was going to be good for my life. And I think that's why God now prospered me a lot and loved me a lot, you know. And when they told me that, that we, if we're going to move here, I'm going to have a better life and I'm going to have a better job and I'm going to have, and I'm going to be a better me. I was like, oh, great. So we're leaving. And that's why we came. Yeah, that's amazing. So basically the love of your parents, um, 
is is what has allowed you to continue to to open up and 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 you even shared that with the story about your professor when she accused you of plagiarism and you were like so taken aback by that that you asked your father you know to to accompany you um and yeah you know i i don't have an extended family either um the the little the few family members we have left are in Cuba. Um, my father was a political prisoner. I've never uh, been back to Cuba, so I don't know even the country where I was born. Don't remember it at all. And so my family is just my sister, you know, my mom and my dad. So I can definitely the relate. Same. The yeah. same as me. Yeah. So I can definitely relate to that. My parents are like my best friend. I feel very blessed. I and only I have one aunt here, and mm -hmm. it's the sister of my mom. But I begin to get in that connection with her, like now, you know, sure. because her my connection with her was pretty like little, like she saw me born, but she stopped seeing me since I was three. But then the only the connection that I have with her was when I go and like go and leave, go and leave, like those trips. That we did to Cuba because I went to Cuba in, in the 2000s in Christmas in summer so you know I was with that connection with my aunt in that way but then um it had stopped for a long time but now she lives here in this country but it's not like the same when when I had her when I was a little kid you know so you understand, like, it's not the same as you can talk the same things to your parent as her, you know? Like, for okay. me, it was like, how I can direct my my thoughts with my aunt if I can direct my thoughts so, so easy with my parents and my brother? So it was hard, but now it's, like, different now because we have, like, more time now together, like, just living now here in this country. So, right. yeah, but it, it was hard, so I know. It is, it is. And when when you don't have a big extended family, at least like in my case, the um my friends were very important to me because they were like that that's they were my family because that, that way it was kind of like my friends were like if they were my cousins, you know, my best friend is like if it was another sister and that sort of thing. Now, um so your parents have been your support throughout this this whole time, but now here you are, you've already had an album. Like you mentioned, you've had you've had recognition, um, you've had accolades, you've had success, you've had people believe in you, like your first producer, Moises, and now you have a second producer that that is standing with you to move forward with your next album. I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows that they can find your music, you know, everywhere, like you said, in Spotify and in, in Apple Music. Um, but they have to write it in Spanish. Of course, they have to write that in Spanish. Sanchez nace una esperanza. Exactly. Well, even though you, you put it down here, if you can, English and Spanish, but they have to put it in, in Spanish. Absolutely. Yeah, and we're going to include that all in the show notes so that they can find your album. One of my favorites, well, I'm going to say two of my favorite songs on that album is I Love You So. I think that is such... Oh, you, you know that I Love You So. My brother did the music. And I sing with them. I sing with him. And yeah, the one who's doing the, the, it was him, the ukulele like this. Yeah, the ukulele, yeah. My brother was, all of that song in his hands. Everyone loved that song. I'm so glad. Yeah, I absolutely love that song. They're all great, but I just wanted to point out my favorites. I love Who Am I? I love that one too. Mm -hmm. And in Spanish, I love Mi Esperanza. Mi Esperanza is, is gorgeous. They're all beautiful songs. Um, you remind me a lot, but the first album that Shakira did, Pies Descalzos, I, to me, that was like the real Shakira. I still love Shakira, but she wrote, she's a songwriter and she wrote those songs. And I remember when I first heard that album, I was like, this is so like, she's telling the story. Like back then you didn't hear music like that. And some people thought it was too far out. But she had a bunch of songs that weren't as popular on the radio. But your words and your songs remind me a lot of that style where it sounds literally like you're talking to us and telling us your story. And it just sounds so raw. Um, and you know what I mean by that, right? Like it's not polished up 
to make it, you know, just so that the, the words rhyme and all that kind of stuff. I love music that comes across authentic to the artist that's singing it. So I just wanted to, to share that with you because I was really Thank you. <laughs> touched, yeah, touched by how, what a talent, you're a beautiful singer, but you're a very talented songwriter. And I think, yeah, and I think anyone that has the opportunity and that downloads your, your album will hear that. But then you mentioned something that really caught my attention. So opera rock. So this is the direction you're going in now, right? Mm -hmm. That sounds amazing. And is and is the album in production now? Are you in the process of writing? No, the album is in production now. I don't still have a name. But this album, I'm, I'm, I'm working with Vivan Trujillo, um, my new producer. And yeah, Opera Rock. Oh, the sun is getting there. It, I love it. Of course, in Spanish, um, but it's getting there. I love it. Um, the people that are working in Mexico already hear it when they came one time to visit us. And when they hear it, the girl that, that is helping me in my clothes and in my makeup over there in, in Mexico for everything, she told me, Ellie, like, this is you? And I'm like, yes. And, and she said, like, this is like a new aspect of you. It's the new Elizabeth. You're shining. You're born again. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> and, and she's like, like, you are a type of, she told me that I'm a type of artist that I don't tell everything, that I put everything like for a surprise to the people that will hear me. And she told me that's the best thing that I like about you because you, you don't post too much things in social media and you, you, when you post, you post the right things and you give to the people the things that they need. And, and when the sun comes, you only put the times and the stuff, wait for the sun. And, and she likes that. But I felt that in that way of working is the way that I appreciate even more the people that are following me, you know? Right. That they, I don't, that they I don't, see you. Hmm? They see I don't you talk about you. those people, about fans. I talk about them as a family. Or, or as a person that maybe will, will sometimes will suffer or pass something that I pass. And when they saw me in TV shows, because I went to Primer Impacto, Despierta America two times in Univision. Um, I, I did my story life in Club 700. It's a, a Christian network that it doesn't took a lot of people. They are very selective and they select me for, for that program. So I'm like that. I really like to put in my social media important things that the people will get attached to their life, right. not to following me, to exactly. get attached to their own life so they could get more things, say more things to other people that will come behind I them. I love that. I love that because it's, you're right. It's not about having the adoration. It's not about being able to say, I have this many followers or this many fans. Um, it, what you're saying is I want my gift, what I've experienced, what I want to share, what I want to express to touch someone's life. And I want them to feel that they're seen, that they're heard through something that I created, which could very well inspire them to do the same, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and that's, why, that's why I was mentioning that, you know, how cool that you're taking your love of opera and you're creating something totally new, um, which is still all you, it's just another aspect. And that's what an artist is. An artist is evolving. An artist is always curious you know, pushing the envelope to really be um, open-minded to, to the fact that music and art has no boundaries to how it can be expressed and enjoyed. So congratulations for that. And then you're also, because obviously you're good with words, that's right, why you write your songs. Um, do you have a title for your book yet or a possible release date? Mm -hmm. Yeah. My book is, again, I'm going to say it in Spanish. <laughs> yeah, go right ahead. 
eh, Viva de Milagro. And I'm working with the editorial Pan House. Excellent, my goodness, congratulations. So you're just 30 years old, just 30 years old. And I mean, I hope, and I'm, I'm sure, I hope that by this point that you're 150% proud of yourself. Um, mm -hmm. you know, to the, the way that you're putting yourself out there, that you have put yourself out there, that you continue to focus on, on your faith and you continue to focus on what brings you joy so you can share it with others, no matter what, you know, the obstacles are, that's huge. Um, you told us today a real story, you know, from birth through early childhood, adolescent, and even young adulthood that I think a lot of people can relate to. Um, and, you've, and you've turned all of that into a triumph. I think this is just the beginning for you, most definitely. You know, I'm so glad that you understand my story in the way that sometimes I want that people understand it. And I'm, and thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Because you understand it like in such like in a beautiful way that now when I'm talking to you, like I change, like sometimes my, when I talk to other people, I know they understand it, but you understand it like even way better than some, some other people. So thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. That means a lot to me. That means a lot to me. I think like I, like I started, you know, here when I, when I um, introduced you, you know, I really created this, this moment to share with others, people that I know just care about others because that's, that's really what we're here for. We're, we're here. God put us on earth to love each other the way that we love ourselves. And I know that self-love is so important. I talk about that too in other um, interviews that I've done and everything. But if we don't love others, if we don't listen with our heart, right? That's why God gave us, you know, two ears and one mouth, they say. Um, and listening to you was, was just an honor for me. Um, I, I think that, you know, that not enough people share their honest feelings about everything like how you said the professor you said the professor ate me and I heard you and I was like some people be like oh it's not that it's you no I get it there were there were teachers that I had that I was like oh my god this teacher hates me I was like what is going on I can't seem to do anything right you know it's like I felt that vibe I felt that energy and I remember, so when I was listening to you, I was like, oh my gosh, I remember going through those feelings. And there was no handbook that would say, oh, go to page three. What to do when you feel like your teacher is looking at you like you're like the worst person on the planet. And even as an adult, because, the, you know, because you were an adult at that point. But here's the truth. It's, we are all like little seven-year-olds, right? I don't mm -hmm. care if you're 25, 30, 40, 50 years old all of us really inside, we're seven-year-olds. Like right now, it's your seven-year-old and my seven-year-old totally understanding each other. Yeah. Be because that's what we're carrying around all the time is that little kid inside of us. Um, so yeah, I, I, I related to everything you said and I'm sure other people will too because you were speaking from the heart. So I wanna just thank you for that again. Keep um, shining, keep singing. I dance. I wish I could sing. I can't. I sing, but people are like, please stop. <laughs> so funny. But, but I love the fact that you and I are going to be connected forever. Um, I can't wait for everyone to check out your music. I'll make sure to have that all included in the description and in the links. And what's your possible release date for your book? Um, well, I is still having a problem with the front page with the cover yeah with the cover because some pictures the first pictures that they sent to us the editorial we didn't like and now a friend of us is helping me uh, with the cover and now it's getting there 
So when the cover is ready, I'm going to put everything in my social media. Of course, Instagram, that's the social media that I most use. And I'm going to be releasing it and telling her, oh, look, finally, my book is here. Viva de Milagro. And now you can find it in Amazon. I'm also going to be doing, a, I don't know how you say this in English. Like when you have like to put a place and you have to show your book to the people so they could buy it. And you're sure, like a, a, a book, like a book signing tour. Yes. <laughs> it's fine. Help me. So when I do one of this, I'm going to send you also the invitation because I'm going to do an invitation for all of my friends. So I'm going to send you one and I'm going to send it to you through WhatsApp. So if you can go to, through there, you're more than welcome and inviting. Absolutely. And I can't wait. Yeah. So we're trying also to find the date and the place. Because I want to do it here in Miami and in Orlando also and in Tampa. Oh, I'm so excited for you. I will be there. I will spread the word. I will share it with everyone. So Elizabeth, if there's any last words that you want to share with the viewers to give them any inspiration, what would you, what would you tell them? Well, first of all, thank you for when you see this video. Please don't laugh about my Spanglish, first of all. <laughs> Oh, please. Um, um, thank you so much um, for wanting me to meet me. Thank you for now being my friend and for giving me, for letting me be me. And the time that we talked that I was in Orlando and I was passing that day when you called me a pretty hard time in my life at that time, you spoke through me like was like God was speaking to me in that time. So I'm always going to be thankful for that because you released me that night from a lot of things that I was passing last night. And I always going to thank you for because of that. Um, and to all the people that we're going to hear and see this interview, please don't, know, don't only take it by your ears, but put this interview in your heart because God will always guide you, guide us, everyone in this world, to the best place that He wants us to go. So please accept every step that God that God give give us, and don't be sometimes too harsh with the people that you're meeting. And don't be like me one time that oh I don't want to meet this person. No, don't be like that. Be like I want to meet them. I don't know if because of that person I could go through this way or or to that way. Sometimes you don't know what people God, what persons God, what persons will God will bring you to your life that will lead you to a better place that you are now. So, okay, be thankful for everyone and also be thankful for the bad times and the bad people that come because it's the time that you grow as human beings. That's right. Beautifully said, Elizabeth. And with that, I just want to remind everyone that Simply M, the movement, is exactly that. I want you to move through life. Remember, there's that dash between the year you were born and the year eventually it comes for all of us. When we're no longer here, everything in between the dash is what you do with that life. So you don't want to leave books that you were supposed to write that you didn't write. You don't want to leave any songs unsung. You don't want to leave that dance floor empty without you. So Elizabeth, you're out there sharing your gift. You're an inspiration for me. And I know that you're going to be an inspiration for others. So everyone stay blessed, stay happy, be a blessing to others. And I hope to see you again soon. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you.